Hello and welcome. I'm Liesl, a proud member of the TV team at Oxford University Press. I want to firstly thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Before we get into today's presentation, I would like to share with you a little bit more about Oxford University Press South Africa. Oxford, as we are more commonly known as, publishes for all educational sectors, including schools, higher education, and of course, TVET. We are an award-winning educational publisher with over 100 years of publishing experience in South Africa. Oxford University Press is South Africa's number one dictionary and literature publisher. We publish more than 2,700 books in 11 official home languages. Our books are well-researched and we pride ourselves in the delivery of high service standards. There's a renewed focus from the government towards CBIT institutions and the upskilling of people and preparing them to enter the 21st century workplace confidently. We recognize the power of education to change and advance knowledge and learning by uplifting and empowering individuals. We strive in our commitment to develop and deliver high quality and affordable educational materials to learners, students, teachers, and lecturers. You, as lecturers, while you play a critical part in the delivery and the development of our youth. You stand at the front line of the educational system, and we understand that these changes and shifts as you respond to the demands of the fourth industrial revolution can cause uncertainty. But by choosing to attend this presentation, you've taken the first step in responding to these changes. And it's our privilege to partner with you along this journey. Right, well, welcome everybody. Um, our reason really for getting together today is to interact with the authors of our new uh, coding and robotics titles. And we're very excited to learn more about programming. We get the sense that people are very anxious to know how this is gonna play out. It's a brand new syllabus for 2023. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the content on programming for level two. Welcome to our presentation on the programming level two syllabus and our book for the syllabus. My name is Brian Dole and my fellow author or co-author is Shani Nunkumar. Shani will be presenting the second half of our talk with you today. The main aim of the subject is naturally to help the student to learn to program. However, with that, it also teaches the student many other skills, such as problem solving, such as how to break down larger problems into smaller pieces and solve them a piece at a time so that eventually they come up with a good solution to a big problem. And this problem solving ability stretches beyond the subject into all the other subjects and they carry it with them through life. In terms of the teaching time required, the um, syllabus is intended to be presented over uh, two semesters full time, spanning 24 weeks, not including the assessment. And each week, there should be two double lessons of approximately an hour and 50 minutes each, as well as a single lesson of approximately 50 minutes. And then over the 24 weeks, that works out to 56 hours at roughly four and a half hours each week. And that should be broken down into instructor-led contact hours for around 36 hours and another 18 hours where the students are engaged with their practical tutorials and the instructor is there to facilitate those practical sessions. In addition to this, the students should have access to the computers for a further 10 hours per term, about one and a half hours a week, so that they can practice on their own and reinforce their skills. In terms of the resources, any existing computer facility, computer lab is really um, 
in order for this subject, in order to be able to present it. Students need to be able to work at a Windows PC and the resources that are required, um, as you will see as we go through, are all really free resources in terms of software. So the block-based programming, the visual programming, as well as the actual text-based coding, those environments and the editors are all available for free. So there's no additional cost required to cover that. Um, in terms of other infrastructure, this syllabus, um, along with the robotics syllabus, was designed to be done using the Raspberry Pi. And we will see later on that in terms of the programming syllabus, you could actually complete the syllabus without the Raspberry Pi, although it is recommended and that is requirement by the syllabus, should it be proved to be difficult to actually source the Raspberry Pis. Human resources, you would need a lecturer that is skilled um, in this area in computer programming um, and that is able to lead and inspire the students and who is passionate about this. In terms of the infrastructure and the budget, um, as I said, it can be done, the syllabus can be presented in an existing computer lab. It doesn't require additional facilities, obviously timetable in permitting. And those um, computers in the computer facilities do need to be upgraded on a regular basis, at least every four to five years to ensure that the students have a stable environment in which they can work. And especially during tests and exams that you, that you as the lecturer and the students can be um, at peace that the equipment is stable and reliable. The topics in the syllabus um, consist of the following. It starts off, the first topic is computer and hardware. Then there is a section on problem solving in computer programming. And we have integrated that. Um, it, it is a standalone topic in the book, but we have also integrated it with the rest of the topics throughout the book. So this thread of problem solving and the tools that are used are taken through. Then there concept, concepts of programming for a single board, microprocessor or microcontroller. In this case, it is designed to be done using a Raspberry Pi. But as I said before, for the programming section, you can actually do most of it without a, a Raspberry Pi. And then topic four is about the programming tools um, and in topic four, we start looking at Python programming, and we also look at utilities that um, back up um, and provide the student with a version control system so that they can be sure that they know that uh, which version of their program they are working on. And then topics five to 12, are solution development, and they are all about Python programming, and that is the section that Shani will present to you. The computer and hardware in the first topic, the introduction to the hardware, as well as the typical components that you find in a computer, is essential for the student to understand what they are working with. And also to be sure that they know what all the different parts of the computer are and are able to identify them. And in this book, this section is accompanied by all the relevant illustrations, although ultimately it is always best if you can show real life examples to the students, especially those students that are not familiar with a computing or programming environment. And then the third unit in this topic is all about the Windows command prompt, where the students are introduced to text-based commands, com so-called command line 
um, programming. It's not actually programming at this stage. Um, it is an introduction to working with those text-based command as opposed to just being able to click a button. Um, and this deepens the student's computer knowledge and um, strengthens their confidence in being able to work with a computer and eventually with their programming as well. Then, topic two, which is all about the problem solving processes and the problem solving tools that the students um, need to be able to use. Um, it includes concepts such as the programming development life cycle and how to construct an algorithm, how to use tools such as noun verb analysis, um, flow charts, and other supporting tools that helps the student to work through their problem solving process and plan a program before they actually start programming. Topic three takes us into the actual programming environment. And this is specifically designed for use on the single board microprocessor for both Scratch as a visual programming environment and Python as a text-based programming environment. And the microcontroller that is used is the Raspberry Pi, as previously mentioned. Unit 3.1 is quite an extensive unit. Um, it is about visual programming. It is done in the Scratch environment. And this is a section that introduces the students to programming in, a, in an easy way, in a non-threatening way, because people are often um, a little bit afraid of programming. It has a reputation for maybe being rather difficult. And the scratch environment is there to help alleviate the stress and to realize that you can actually solve problems. And in the end, the programming language is just the tool in which you create the solution. And so when you're working in Scratch, the student does not have to worry about learning the syntax and things like that that are associated with the um, text-based programming, and they can focus just on the problem solving. We have also integrated the tools from topic two into all the problems. The problems are, uh, many of the examples are real life, something that is applicable to everyday life. And we have integrated those problem solving tools into designing the solutions to these programs throughout the book. And then unit 3.2, uh, the student is introduced on how to actually install Python on the Raspberry Pi and work with the Raspberry Pi and its menus. Um, and then it goes through in unit 3.3 to creating some of the very basic Python applications. And this unit uses something called the Turtle Library, which produces a graphical output and which the student can then relate back to the environment that they are used to seeing in Scratch. Although they will not be coding with blocks, they still have the visual output that is very similar to the way in which this, the objects were moved around in Scratch. And then we go to topic four, which is your introduction to your high level programming language now moving away from the visual programming of scratch and looking and starting to look at more in more detail at python which is a text based programming language the unit starts off with a section on source control and the source control um, is where the students learn all about how to take care of the different versions of their program so that they don't accidentally overwrite a new version with an older version or get lost and can't figure out which version is the one they actually are currently working on. And then the, the introduction to Python here is very basic and the detail of the language 
is done from program uh, topic five onwards, and Shani will now take you through that section. Good day, I am Shani Nan Kumar, and I will be presenting <clears throat> programming level two, topics five to ten. I will also be looking at continuous assessment requirements as well as external examination requirements. Let's start with topic five, which is data types, variables, and output. The first unit, unit 5.1, looks at a review of scratch and generic concepts. Now here, we are trying to link work that has previously been covered with this chapter as well. We look at, in particular, at topic two, which covered core generic concepts um, and how in topic three, how they were implemented in Scratch. And bringing all of this together, we are going to look at how it is going to be implemented in Python programming. In unit 5.2, we deal with Python data types, which is the integer, float, boolean, character, and string. And we look at for each data type, what kinds of operations can be performed on certain data types? In unit 5.3, we look at arithmetic operations in particular to integer and floating point operations. And here, once again, we bring in, we link knowledge in terms of mathematics where we look at the precedence uh, rules. In unit 5.4, we look at positional number systems, and we're looking at the decimal number system, the binary number system, and the hexadecimal number system. We look to see how the binary number system and the hexadecimal number systems are used in the, the computer for storage purposes. We also can, the focus is also on conversion between the different number systems. In unit 5.5, we will be working with characters and strings in terms of what is the difference between a character and a string. And we look at how to format these uh, characters and string. The chapter a unit goes on to um, work with string um, methods, which is string functions. And these string functions are then used in problem solving. In unit 5.6, we look at basic file output. And here we are looking at uh, text files, reading from a text file, manipulating a text file, and writing to a, a, a text file. <clears throat> we move on to topic 6. In topic 6, it is maths, interactive input, constants, and errors. In unit 6.1, we deal with Python keyboard input and how this input is stored in, in, in Python and what happened uh, in, in the form of a string and how then we can move, uh, convert type string either to type integer or type float and how should errors be handled uh, during the conversion. In unit 6.2, we look at Python maths library functions such as your floor, your C, your square root. Um, and we look at how these library for maths library functions can be used in problem solving. In unit seven, selection control structures. In 7.1, we once again revisit topic two uh, in terms of how selection is handled as a fundamental concept in uh, topic two and how this concept was implemented in Scratch programming and how it is going to be implemented in Python programming. In unit 7.2, we look at how to create conditional tests using logical operators. And in unit 7.3, we look at the different selection statements, the if, the if else, and the if else, if else statements. In topic eight, repetition control structures, once again, in unit 8.1, we've revisit uh, topic number two and see how repetition is handled as a uh, fundamental core concept and how it was implemented in Scratch and how we are then going to implement it in Python programming. 
Unit 8.2 deals with the while repetition control. Um, and we look at looping here, how it is a conditional looping structure and how the ICE TC principle is applied, initialize, test, and change. In 8.3, we deal with the four repetition control. And in 8.4, we deal with nested loops. And this nest loops can either be uh, of the same type or of different types. In unit nine, we deal with modularization and functions. And in 9.1, we look at variable scopes, that is local variables versus global variables. In 9.2, we deal with simple Python functions. Now, if we look back, we have already dealt with built-in functions in Python, but these are user-defined functions that will be handled in this unit. We move on to chapter 10, which is arrays and lists, and we're dealing with one-dimensional arrays and basic lists as data structures. And here we are going to be looking at how to transverse, how to work at some average count, um, and basically uh, write to these data structures. We're also going to be looking at basic fun list functions that can be applied for problem solving as well. That brings us to the end of our topics. We will now look at internal assessment and weightings. Now, internal assessment forms 50% of the weight and external assessment forms 50%. Now, if you look at the first uh, table on to the right, you will find you have continuous assessment, which forms 50% which is for part of internal assessment. And you look at the ISAT, which forms 15%, and the external assess, uh, examinations forms 30%. So ISAT, which is 15%, and external examination, which is 35%, forms 50%, which then gives you your external assessment. The, both the external assessments are set externally. If we look at the next table, we got the continuous assessment uh, task, internal as part of internal assessment, and that is made up of two tests, practical assessment uh, two and internal examination, we have one. And on the right-hand side of the second table, you will find the weightings of the continuous assessment, which means 10% times two gives you 20% for the two tests. For the two practical assessments, it's 25% times two, which gives you 50%, and your internal assessment forms 30%. We're now going to look at the national assessment and weightings. As per the directive, national directive, paper one is a theory paper, and it will count 100 marks uh, for two hours. Uh, paper two is a uh, computer-based uh, assessment, which is uh, involves design, practical, and programming-related concepts, and it counts 100 marks and three and a half hours. The breakdown of the paper one and two are given on your right. If you look at paper two, which is the practical, topic one covers 2% of the weight, topic two, 18%, topic three, 20%, topic four, 10%, and topics five to 10, 50%. The paper one, which is your theory, um, algorithm design, short paper-based programming questions. Your topic one covers 20%, topic two, 25%, topic three, 10%, topic four, 10%, and topics five to 10, 35%. We then move on to the sample national paper one and paper two. Uh, examination paper. Uh, the book provides our support to an anticipated national examination uh, paper, sample paper that has been prepared. Uh, this paper was prepared taking into cognizance the breakdown, marks breakdown from the previous slide. And in the absence of a national a sample paper, this was going to provide the guidance that is the necessary guidance that is required. And finally, this then brings me to the end of my presentation. And I want to thank you. Thank you.
you very much, Brian and Shani. <clears throat> We're now going to have a look at the books that have been published and approved by the DHET um, for use next year. And Asif and the managing editor who worked on these books is going to actually have a look at those for us. Good day, colleagues. So today, our piece here today, and before I get into it, I'm sitting here with our managing editor, Amira Juta, who has worked tirelessly in the background to bring us our beautiful NCV textbook. So these are the student books for EDCR, which is Electronics and Digital Concepts for Robotics, Programming and Robotics. And for each student book that was created, a lecturer guide is accompanying it as well. So in today's session, I will be basically checking in with Amira. Um, what are the features, benefits and advantages that we used in the books um, as she worked very closely with, with them and her team in creating the end product, um, just to ensure that when you do receive the books or contemplate purchasing the books, you know exactly what it is that we have put into the books and why we have done that. So, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Asif Kapoor. I am the vocational publisher at Oxford University Press. Um, just a little bit of background. I've come from the TV sector. I've been in the classrooms. I've taught NCP level two, three, and four, as well as the report 191 in 426. So, Working with Amira in terms of the content, we know exactly the market and the audience that we are presenting this to. And we are quite excited about this because it is such a new but relevant um, subject and area for, for the world, not only education, and that's coding and robotics moving into the fourth industrial and fifth industrial revolution, where technology is becoming more um, prevalent in today's labor market needs. So these textbooks and subjects are really geared towards skills development of our students in the NCV programs, gearing them up for the labor market. So I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the NCV landscape, but I want to get into the actual um, crux of our books. Before we get into the books, I just want to give you a little bit of context. The NCV Coding and Robotics program is a specialized program within the IT program. So students registering for the ICT program would then have the alternative of going into a specialized stream of coding and robotics. So it still exists with your seven normal subjects in NCV, the three fundamental subjects and the four core subjects. And the three for which the DHET has uh, made a call for submissions was programming, electronics and digital concepts and robotics. Mm -hmm. And those three together for level two will form part of the NCV program. And level two will be implemented in January 2023. Level three, 2024, and level four, finally in 2025. And we are quite excited to get started on those books as well. But we are going to stick with the level two for this discussion. Um, so Amira, Immediately when I open these mm -hmm. books, not even before I open it, I'm already attracted by the colors yes. at the top. So I'm a very color um, oriented person or learner and visually attracted by colors. Mm -hmm. And this makes me actually want to pick up the book and know what is inside. So what are these colors actually about? Okay, so the colors, like you said, it's a really engaging, right? Like you're thinking, okay, why, why the rainbow? Yeah, going yeah. on there. So immediately, so this is to identify each module. Okay. Yeah. So immediately, students oh, will know cool. if they go to the yellow, that would be module three. So like okay. once they've already gone through the books, they'll know. Okay, there's something I needed to double check upon. Just open on top. They see. Go straight to module three. Okay. So it's color coordinated just to help students firstly be visually attractive, those mm -hmm. who are visually attractive to colors. Um, and then also identify that even if I look at the top, oh, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven colors. And I know what the colors represent. There's seven modules yeah, within the book. Module. Okay, and I take it that if I'm flipping open, that these colors will coordinate with the table of contents. 
yes. colors as exactly. well. So if I see blue for module one, that would be representative of the blue yeah. pages. Exactly. Green for module two. Okay, okay. Visually appealing to the students. And quite easily identified for referencing and indexing for context purposes. So yeah. module three, I can immediately go there if I don't wish to use the page number. Yeah, allocation. I mean, especially for programming, which is a, a bigger book, more pages. So then you'll know immediately, okay, I go straight to the top. I don't have to go okay. straight to the contents page. Module three. Know, so that's quite a, a nice um, element that was added into the design of the book. Yeah. So that was quite interesting. And I see it's full color. So I'm full just color. flipping through the pages and immediately I'm attracted in terms of the color. And the and I'm just going to stop on any module. And I've got module two. Yep. Okay. So immediately as I open it up, mm -hmm. I can see that there's a double page spread yep. consisting of units, learning outcomes, module vocabulary, and starting points. So let's look at the units and learning outcomes. What, what is that in aid of? So this, the learning outcomes is taken directly from the syllabus. Okay. Yeah. And that's the syllabus that is directly provided to us from the Department of Higher Education and Training. And we take each subject outcome or specific outcome, SO, and each learning outcome and carefully plot them in the same flow as what the syllabus has it. So that you as the lecturer as well as the students know exactly what to expect per module mm. and all the learning outcomes that needs to happen from the start to the end of the module. And then I see we have module vocabularies and a starting point. Yeah, so what I like about the module vocabulary is that it gives the learners the key terms that's going okay. to be used throughout the module. And again, it's just accessible and it's like really engaging for the learners. So they'll know, okay, what key terms to look out for throughout. And then for the starting point, yeah. I think that's also just to really like engage with the learners to give them like a, a, a relatable idea of, of like yeah, because I can see here's like two friends that are busy coding and then the story kind of speaks in a plain language that is understood yeah. by a level two entrant student in terms of a problem, a real life scenario mm. problem that exists within the story. So students are actually more attracted to a narrative or to a story and this helps them contextualize a visual in their mind before actually starting yeah. with the actual module and the problem the solutions to the problem of the scenario will be found in the learning outcomes so i kind of see why this was put on one yeah. um, double page spread together so that they can see what it is they need to achieve at the end of the module and not only what they must achieve but why they should achieve it mm. in terms of the solution that it gives to the starting point yeah. and I, I did like a sneak peek through the book and I saw that these module vocabularies are then identified in the actual pages of the modules mm. and then beautifully put at the bottom it's highlighted in bold in the book and then it comes across as a definition box yeah and that's quite cool because the vocabulary means nothing if there's no context. Mm, exactly. So now they're just introduced to the words at the beginning, but during the module, as that word pops up, they are given the exactly. definition. Yeah, exact definition of it. And now they can make sense of yeah. the actual context of why they are reading. Because at the end of the day, a flow chart in Excel may mean something very different to a flow chart in programming. Mm. So to give context around very general types of words helps students understand what they are reading and not just reading it for mm. the sake of reading. And the same goes for the storyline as well. It keeps them interested. It keeps them throughout, engaged. Yeah, it keeps them interested and engaged throughout the module. And then do we meet these characters? Um, uh, because I know you said that they are specifically chosen um, to engage with learners and make it relatable mm -hmm. but do we meet up with these characters later in the different modules or the friends yeah some of them some of them hang out to the next module okay. yeah like and like even specifically with the names that we've chosen as well we like to keep it diverse and um yeah so like 
as relatable as possible. So, okay, so there was an element of inclusivity and yeah, diversity yeah. also implemented. I think that was also important keeping as, it local well. Yeah, as well. Yeah, as well. Okay, so here we see that it's not only written off in the one module where you meet characters, but that the story actually mm. integrates into the different modules as well, being passed on as if they were watching a story yeah. with different characters. Yeah. And that is such a cool element. Yeah, I really like that about this. I about mean, the it's, book. It's coding, but there's <laughs> like a nice storyline that flows for yes. someone of that age as well. And it makes it a bit more engaging and interesting for mm. students that may already um, I won't say not have had programming at school, but um, may not have had programming in such an engaging manner exactly. at school. And now it's brought to life, mm. call it that. Um, right, so if I look at different elements, there's a lot of pictures and text. And so just the pictures and text, What? so why would I need a picture and text? Well, I mean... For programming specifically the subject there's a lot of text there's a lot of steps that you have to follow and so um the picture element was really important as well to accommodate those different learning abilities so okay. some students love to look at pictures where others follow the text closely yes, yes. um so we just wanted to give that different elements to kids who learn differently okay and I, for one, must say that I'm attracted visually to the images. And mm. then I saw another element, which I'm going to now, is the QR codes. Um, mm. And then I will get to text. So I don't know how <laughs> you learn or how you learn, but definitely I appreciate the element of. And although we're using programming as the main reference here, you will find this in all three books in yeah. terms of the electronics, the robotics, and the programming. So the recipe we're discussing here will filter through in all the books. Mm. Um, and then jumping to the QR codes, I saw we had QR codes in here as well. So that to me is very uh, forward thinking in terms of the digital age that we are living in. And I mean, everybody nowadays has a smartphone. Yeah. I'm just trying to locate the QR code quickly. So that's why I'm flipping through the pages. If you can find one quickly in your robotics book, that will be awesome. Um, but the QR codes is just adding another element to the... Um, to the learning experience and enhancing it. So the core material or work is captured within the textbook. So also to be sensitive to the digital divide that we mm. do have at colleges and sensitive around data usage and things like that. The core work rests within the textbook. Yeah. But the QR code, have you found one in your book? Uh, I, oh, I did, I did actually. Awesome. One's just there. And then what is that QR code telling us? Uh, what a microprocessor is. Mm. So we have the text that indicates what the processor is, but for additional and enhanced learning, you can scan the code, you or the students, just to give that extra bit of um, definition or depth to a certain component. And these videos were carefully selected by the authors. Um, and you can watch out different segments in terms of who the authors are, uh, meeting them and um, what they have to say about the syllabus specifically in each of the specialized areas and then just jumping ahead we will no I'll save that for later yeah I just want to say later. another thing about the QR codes is again with the text some tr some uh, learners also prefer the additional information so sometimes they don't really fully grasp just on text like what's there so they would want to I know for myself if I really don't understand something I'm gonna go and google it yes. <laughs> so this is like that type of additional and um, you know when you search YouTube you get all exactly. these um, links and yeah. you're not too sure which one yeah so these were carefully selected by the by the authors mm. to ensure that if it wasn't a South African one that it at least speaks specifically to the the, the segment of work and it doesn't overwhelm the students yeah. because as a lecturer, I definitely felt the value that students expressed um, of micro lessons in videos. So the power of videos is actually a good element to add to the learning experience. Mm. Um, so when we look at the book, we have the starting points. We have, I see there's multiple tasks here in as well. And they're not just all at one place. They are scattered throughout yep. the, throughout the book. So um, the tasks would help the students then build up their competence after learning and we're not giving them an overwhelm of work before yeah. testing their knowledge yeah. and we're not giving them 
particular tool work, which would be very easy then to test. So it, it's quite a considerable amount of content that was given first before mm -hmm. a task. Mm -hmm. And there are multiple tasks. And definitely in the discussion that we had earlier, lecturers, we don't always have the time yeah. to do all the tasks in class. And as students ourselves once, we didn't want that overwhelm of in-class work. And you also need to give students that time to digest work and work at home or on their own as well. We saw that definitely with COVID-19, um, where remote teaching and learning was the order of the day and students had to take responsibility for their work. So all the tasks, depending on your year plan and lesson plans, can be done in class or they can be assigned as homework to mm. students and they are clearly laid out in terms of instructions for them to follow step-by-step -step guidance and have the book as the reference before attempting to do the actual um, tasks. And then there are certain tasks in certain books of the three that has worked out examples yeah. that help students actually first understand how to approach mm. the question first before we give you an activity. And this also helps you as a lecturer, where if you do not get to all the students to show them how to do an actual example, and we have some students that are fast, mm. faster than mm. others, they can actually go through the book on their own. And that is what I appreciate of the different elements of the pictures and the step-by-step -step mm. mm. guidance that was given. And the screenshots. That to me was a very important element in the books, mm. especially with the programming book. So um, looking at the syllabus for programming and robotics, um, there is uh, the use of the Raspberry Pi um, and cat, uh, Scratch Cat, because I'm thinking of the cat that comes along with the Scratch program. So Scratch and Python and, and we know that that is a specific software and where the screenshots actually help students visualize and see what it is yeah. they need to expect on their screen and also allows them to work outside of your classroom without your constant guidance there should that save you time. Yeah, it also gives them confidence to know that they can do it on their own because they have these um, guides for, for them. So yes. they don't always need the help of the lecturer, like you yeah. said. And we're not saying your job isn't important, but <laughs> it's definitely the elements that are helping. And I like what you said there, the confidence. Yeah. And that is what we need to build up in our students as early as level two, is mm. building up that not only competence, but the confidence, confidence in them actually achieving something and how better or what a better way to achieve something than working through mm. um, a problem or query on your own and achieving at the end. Okay. So talking about competence and confidence in students and building up their knowledge from what they've learned mm -hmm. through the different activities and achieving those outcomes. Um, at the, uh, before we get to the next module, what feature do students then have once they have learned all what is needed within a module? What okay. feature do we have at So the what's end? really nice is this, uh, there's two things. This is module summary, just a quick summary okay. of the entire module. And then um, they have what's called the self-evaluation checklist. Okay. So it's the outcomes. So there's a, a, a key question that says, can you okay. with the learning outcomes? Yeah. And then it's basically the students just check what they have learned throughout the module. and. If they weren't sure about something, they can go back and refer to that specific section in the book. Okay, maybe I need to go back to this uh, section. Let me go through that again. And, and what I like here in the... Um, okay, let me back there. So the module summary is quite nice because you've learned quite a bit of work mm. already. And now you're just summarizing it in quite a comprehensive way. Because I can see it's not overloaded with information. It's just key bullet points just, yeah, very of similar. what was learned. And then self-evaluation checklist. Mm. That is what I like. So you're giving students the responsibility and ownership mm. for their own studies. Yeah. Um, in terms of a valuable tool such as a self-evaluation checklist. And as I made, I said, the, the checklist points are directly the learning outcomes mm. of the syllabus with three columns. Can you? Yes. 
I can achieve this or no, not yet. I'm not yet there. Mm -hmm. And the no can be for various reasons. The student was absent, doesn't quite understand the concept. And beautifully, the last column is the page difference. Yeah. So students can actually go back to the exact spot where this information will then be found within the module. So students have a summary plus a self-evaluation checklist that can help them ensure knowing all the work before what I see next, which is a practical task as well as a theory task. Mm. So Amira, I, I, I don't know if you know, but definitely the TVET market or landscape is very practically orientated. So very hands-on. Mm. And these subjects lend themselves to a practical nature. And the use of a practical task, as well as a theory task, helps students actually combine their knowledge and use it or apply their yeah. knowledge um, in either a simulated environment or creating a project or instead of just the normal mm -hmm. true and false yeah. type of offering. Yeah. So that's quite interesting at the end of each module as well. And then tell me, once the students has completed these assessments, where will I find the answers? In the, wait for it, lecturer's guide. Okay, perfect. So Amira has the robotics one, there's electronics, and there's programming. So in all the lecturer guides, you will have, and this we know will be key to you as the lecturer, in terms of assisting you with your workload, assisting you with um, resources, tools and resources to actually just immediately dive into the subject, so to speak. And each module, if I'm flipping through it, um, the book is also broken down into the various modules as well as you would find it into the lecture, into the student book. But different to the student book is that you would be sitting with all the answers. Mm -hmm. And a great time saver that I see is included in here is the not only lesson plans or structure yeah. per module, but also a year plan. Yeah. So that actually guides lecturers in terms of the prescribed manner in which they can break down learning outcomes. Mm -hmm throughout the year and it indicates term breaks and things like that as well um, the lecture guide is filled with valuable and useful information before actually starting with each module um, in terms of your resources that you would require for coding and robotics the um, weighted averages for each subject or topic and then how it affects the ICAS and external examination as well and then Quite nicely, I see what you've added to the book as well, was the semester plan mm. or assessment plan. And we know that these are valuable items that feature in the portfolio of assessment for lecturers and portfolio of evidence for our students. So we have these templates included in here as well. And then I'm just going to flip quickly through to one module. Just also, to show just another thing, sorry, I see. Um, the teaching suggestions are also quite valuable. Yes, so immediately jumping onto that, can you say how excited we are about <laughs> these books? So I hope you will be excited about them as well, is that each book opens up again with teaching suggestions mm -hmm. and then QR codes for additional resources. So these are again valuable tools for you as a lecturer to do additional mm -hmm. or pre-reading or additional reading so that you also have a more broader perspective of a certain area of knowledge and not only focus on the learning outcome. So we're giving you additional resources to that learning outcomes. And then you have your um, semester plan suggestions for each um, module and then the answers for all the power breaks, for all the tasks, detailed screenshots and then the end of module assessment also provided the answers in the lecturer guide so that you don't need to still work out the memo and that is what you will excitingly find in your lecturer guide so you have on offer Amira if you can help me that will be the three lecturer guides oh, and then your three see I'll the student book for you so we have the three student books robotics programming and electronics and then the corresponding lecturer guides for electronics robotics and programming so that is what you can expect with the purchasing of the Oxford range and um, succeeding series and then you can watch this in a separate segment to bring together 
the knowledge, the integrated knowledge of all three subjects. We have developed this unique and exciting uh, workbook, integrated workbook, and powered by Resolute Education. So Resolute Education is our industry partner that has a wealth of experience in the coding and robotics arena. And they have worked with us and our team at Oxford to put together this beautiful workbook that is step-by-step -step guide, uh, pictured and broken down per term. So students would learn something, do the project for term one. Learn, do, learn, do. But I won't, I won't give too much away in this uh, section of the video. So catch the next section of the series of videos that will explain to you the exciting features, benefits and advantages of the work. So thank you very much, Amira, for joining me and yes. taking us through the, um, the features, benefits and advantages of the book. I'm excited to have these books in my hands and actually want to register for this course. And I do hope that you, your lecturers, your college, your students will also benefit from these books. And we definitely look forward to answering any questions that you do have with the contact details provided within the video segment. So thank you very much and all the best to you and your college for January 2023 with the implementation of Level 2 Coding and Robotics. Thank you very much, Asif. Um, I'm now getting the authors to put on their microphones and web cameras and we're going to turn to the questions that have come in on the chat. Go. Welcome, Shani. I know you had quite a few issues. <laughs> um, Brian still seems to be a problem. Let's just see. But um, okay, one of the first questions is okay, that's all fine. Um, one of the first questions is whether you uh, lecturers are going to get the resources so that they can prepare in advance. Mm, okay. Um, so I think I will tackle that one. Um, so when we refer to resources, um, the, the only resource I can think of that we are able to assist you with in an indirect manner would be the actual curriculum or syllabus document, which we have extracted from and included in either the student book and or the lecturer guide. So um in yesterday's webinar i think a very similar question was also raised in terms of the um resources for your labs and workshops and things like that and what i indicated was that the dhet has already um, been sent names of colleges or colleges has expressed interest to to um provide level two in 2023 and the DHGT has noted those names went to those colleges to do site visits to actually see what resources are available and missing and then basically approve the college for readiness for 2023 so if your college was one of the um, and I think we got 10 college names um, unfortunately, it's DHET's um, list of names and due to the Poppy Act, we as the non-owners of those lists are not able to share that names with you um, in this platform. So check in with your um, communication line, HOD, Program Manager, Deputy CEO for Academics. If your college was in fact one of the ones given as a list to DHET to check resources, what I can indicate is, again, indirectly, we have taken syllabus content, placed it in the lecturer guide and student book. And the lecturer guide, outside of the learning outcomes and specific outcomes for the syllabus, also helps you understand what are your budget requirements, your material requirements, your lab setup requirements um, at, at the beginning of the lecturer guide before we get into the answers of the task. So the lecture guide is quite a valuable resource at this point in time. Um, so I hope that answers that question sufficiently. Thank you. It's a very good question. Okay. Then the next one is someone is asking whether Python and Scratch programming are the only languages that will be used in level two. Okay, Brian, I'm going to um, hand over to you for that one because I know uh, module three was your, your baby for the programming languages. Yes, that, that's correct. Uh, level two is just Python and Scratch, starting with Scratch, and then the Python 
um, based on and leading from from the scratch programming. Okay. Then there's a question about whether any training will be provided for lecturers who are interested in teaching the subject. Um, okay. Is it still a work in progress in the college or how long would it take to master the subject? Okay, perfect. So um, th th that's a very loaded question and I will definitely <laughs> jump in on that on a very excited but also uncertain level. So just to give you a bit of background, the DHET along with their visits to colleges to check readiness has identified um, a sample group of lecturers um, that they are providing training to. But that is from the DHET's um, level. So I know that one week of training has already taken place, now the 22nd to 25th of November, and another week is going to take place with a different set of lecturers now for the 5th and the 9th of December. And the DHET with the colleges that has expressed interest, so those colleges has put forward certain lecturers' names to attend the training. So again, find out from your college community if your college has expressed that interest firstly, and secondly, if they have sent any delegates from your college to attend that training. And I would think that that would need to be cascaded down from those representatives of the colleges to your um, internal staff structure. In addition to that, and what I'm very excited now to share with you, is that Oxford University Press is also gearing themselves up to support colleges and lecturers who either have attended DHET's training or who have not attended DHET's training and got the subject as the allocation for next year. And we are in the process of developing with the same um, experts of authors that wrote the books, professional development course. And that course is a two-day program that will be sharing with you the deep diving of the syllabus. And also in addition to that, showing the practical guidelines, teaching tips and techniques that can be used in order to present this topic. I'm not sure if we will be able to master everything within the two days, but it will definitely give you that confidence and springboard to, to move into um, level two um, implementation. So please, if, if your email address has received this webinar invite, it will definitely be receiving more updates and information within this year before you go on holiday on the 9th or 2nd of December and before the colleges close on the 9th of December around the professional development um, program uh, that we are definitely looking forward to offering come next year. Um, Asif, and then I think going a step back to that, um, the same person I think would like to know what qualification background you would need um, in order to learn to learn to teach this program. Will you come at it from a mechanical, an electrical, or an electronics mm, mm, background? Mm. Okay, so from the syllabus that we have uh, received as draft syllabus for from the DHET to develop our books. Um, the only subject that had a lecturer qualification in it or prescription in it was for robotics. The electronic subject would have the natural qualifications that you would find in the NCV electrical engineering um, programs. And then your programming would have the natural qualification requirements that you would find in your NCV IT programs. The only one that had a very specific um, lecturer qualification background was the robotics. So again, backtracking to what I indicated, when colleges express their interest to implement the program next year, DHET first ensures that your premises is up to scratch. Then the names that are put forward from that college in terms of potential lecturers, the DHET will filter through and ensure that they meet the minimum requirements. Um, so I'm not going to promise, but I will see if I'm able to release that segment of the syllabus that indicates the lecturer qualification when it comes to uh, the three titles, but I know it only sits in robotics. 
So um, I will try my best to release that information. But like I say, we are not the owners of the syllabus document and it needs to come from DHET through your college channels. Okay, then um, there is a question about whether it's possible to provide colleges with material for the course. We will purchase both the textbooks and the resources at once. And then a further question was a follow up in terms of how that people would get the resources that they need to teach this course. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, um, okay. So, uh, Shani, Brian, I hope there are more questions that I can pass on to you. But for mm -hmm. now, I'm just going to jump in straight on this one. So, the, the main resource that we do provide as a publishing house will be the textbooks, which has been written by the authors, as you can see on that slide image that's still up there. So, the textbook resource is available the student book the lecture guide and then we have the epub the e version as well of the student book then additional resources to that that we offer from oxford will be the um the digital platform eduzone that has the um, powerpoint presentations that the authors has nicely developed for you the lecturers per module to immediately start to have something as a visual front of class to start teaching. Um, and you can change what's in that PowerPoint presentation as you feel, add and remove. Um, it's not locked. And so further to that, linking to the workbook that I introduced in my uh, video segment, our partner Resolute Education, their core business is coding and robotics. So they have already um, developed a pre-packed kit that speaks to that workbook and that kit can be purchased from Resolute Education by contacting them directly because I'll be honest with you it's not our core focus in terms of kits and things like that but our industry partner who has partnered with Oxford has those kits available and has opened up their communication lines to the colleges so um, in the workbook that you will receive, their contact details are in there as well as the activation code to get the digital material for the workbook. And you can then make contact with that industry partner that instead of going to different suppliers to get components, they've packaged it into a beautiful kit. But the kit excludes the Raspberry Pi. And that is because colleges are required by the syllabus prescription to make sure students have the Raspberry Pi already. And because that is such an expensive component, it's not included in the kit. So in order to keep the cost at a reasonable price. So those are all the resources that is available. Um, and to get further contact or details on those resources, um, Jackie will insert all the contact details for the very specific individuals, um, one of which is the sales manager. Um, for sample copies, how to get hold of resources and contact details. Yeah, I have actually put it in the chat. Um, Wonderful, thank you. Okay, then um, there's a question about to be able to lecture subject program, the subject programming NCV level two, does the lecturer need to have a full knowledge of both Python and Scratch? And then in addition to that, they'd like to know, is Path, Python programming moving further to level three and level four, or will a different programming language be used? Uh, okay. Shani, will you be okay to answer that? Uh, yes. Um, they have to have equal knowledge of Python and Scratch because the basic uh, programming fundamentals are first implemented in Scratch, and the same fundamentals are then implemented in Python. So yes, subject knowledge for both is are very important. And then if we look at uh, the uh, moving to another programming language, I think in, uh, in, in level three, it's going to be C++. And when we go to level four, it's going to go back to Python programming. I don't know, Brian would, would like to uh, come in uh, in terms of the uh, robots. Or what, or what language are they going to program in level three? Yes, I think in in level three in the robotics um, syllabus they use they use a derivative of C plus plus, which is Arduino C. Okay. So okay. I think that is why it's the language changes in level three 
to match what's happening in the robotics syllabus. Okay, thank you for that, Shani and Brian. And just to add on to that, um, the, the syllabus has been created in such a beautiful way that each um, title, Programming Robotics and Electronics, has one document with one table that shows you level two, three, and four. So once you receive the syllabus, you'll be able to see level two, three, and four in terms of your subject and assessment guidelines. And what's nice is, is that the curriculum developer also indicated in each title where there is an integration. So for example, in robotics, yesterday's webinar, topic five, it's programming, which links to the subject again. Then in robotics, topic three, it's electronics, and that links to the electronics book, which is tomorrow's webinar if you need to know information on that. So there's a nice integration uh, per subject, but also showing how the different core subjects all speak to each other. Because at the end, coding and robotics is not only a singular subject, it's made up of a component of multiple subjects or disciplines. Thank you very much for that, Brian and Shani. Great. And then the last question was, how can I get a soft copy of the programming textbook? Um, at the moment, the books are having final um, tweaks done to them. So where there have been recommendations from the Department of Higher Education and Training, and, and those recommendations are literally just asking for even more tasks to be added. Um, that process is underway. Um, and then there will be a final copy, which will be sent to print in time for 2023. We have actually created soft copies of the books online, but in a protected format. So I can send you a link to have a look at the book online. You won't be able to download it or to distribute it at all, but you can at least browse through it and see what the book offers and be able to make a decision about prescribing the book for next year. Okay, I think Jackie, that is definitely a good um, solution. Mm -hmm. And just to tie into what Jackie indicated of the DHGT's report, I must brag and indicate that we received a hundred percent approval on the book, and that mm -hmm. the recommendations was to make it a hundred and ten percent. So those recommendations are currently being um, added to the book, but the soft copy version that. Um, Jackie has indicated that will be sent together with the thank you email after the webinars with the webinar recording as well, is the actual 100% approved book. Um, another point that I would like to just note from the DHET screening report is that um, a, a good uh, round of applause was given by the screeners on the sample paper one and sample paper two particularly in the programming book, but also speaking to the other two titles of electronics and robotics, that it's a good foundation that DHET, and again, don't read into it in terms of that the, the, the sample papers that we put in is what you can expect. But they indicated as screeners that it's a good foundation that they can work upon in order to develop the actual paper that would be sent by DHET next year. So we, we tried, and myself coming from the NCV background, tried to preempt as much as possible from what DHET will be providing still in next year, which would be the PAT 1, PAT 2, Practical Assessment Task, PAT 1 and 2. And then also the work integrated, the integrated workbook was developed based on anticipated ISAT. So the integrated summative assessment task is what we anticipated in the workbook. Um, so we do believe that that will gear students beautifully up to that ISAT that needs to come from DHET once more. Um, so if there are no further questions, I, uh, Jackie, are there any more? No, um, people have given their email addresses, but um, okay. we do have a register as a result of the requirement of the platform to register. So I will yes. send the link. Okay, perfect. Um, so colleagues, if there are no further questions, um, I'm going to say thank you very much for your time, taking time out of your day this afternoon. Um, I know November, December is very crazy with internal and external marking. We wish you well from our side um, on your, your last few days in 2022 academic calendar. Have a well-deserved holiday and break. Um, and please keep track of your, if you can, of your work emails 
um, during your holiday period just to keep informed of any new updates regarding the professional development next year and any other support mechanisms that we will definitely be looking at providing you, the colleges and lecturers with, as well as your students. Um, so with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Brian, and thank you very much, Shani, for your attendance here today. Um, and we wish you well for the rest of the day.